Hey, we're glad to be here with you this morning. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. In 1990, the way that we explored space changed forever. NASA developed the Hubble telescope and launched it into space with the purpose of capturing detailed images of distant stars and galaxies and other celestial bodies all throughout our universe. Now, if you've seen any pictures of this, you know that they're absolutely breathtaking. It's designed to give us the clearest and most detailed pictures of deep space that we've ever had, and the results are absolutely breathtaking. But what you may not know is that that wasn't always the case. In fact, the initial launch of the Hubble telescope was actually kind of a failure. When NASA launched it in 1990, what they didn't know is that it launched with a design flaw. And so when they finally started getting images back, the scientists noticed that the initial images were blurry and distorted. And the cause of this blur and distortion was an imperfection on the primary mirror within the telescope. Now, this was an imperfection. It was ground to an error of 1 50th the width of a human hair. And so even though it was perfectly polished and prepped to go in this thing, it could not focus light correctly, and it resulted in a distorted image than what it was supposed to be. And so in 1993, this is how long it took them to figure this out, in 1993, NASA had to go on this complex and expensive mission to fix this telescope. So they actually had to send astronauts into space, get to the telescope, take the old mirror out, put the new mirror in, and thankfully, as hard as that was, it did work, and now the telescope functions perfectly. And if you've ever seen any of the photos from it, you know they are some of the most beautiful and famous photos of space that have ever existed. So the original intention of the Hubble telescope wasn't the issue. The creators weren't the issue. The design of the Hubble telescope had no flaws. It was a perfectly designed project. But a small deviation from the original design led to blurry messes instead of the originally intended beautiful pictures. But thankfully, a small correction in this design, when they could get it back to what it was originally intended for, led to incredible results. Well, we're continuing our series, The Lies We Believe, this morning, and what we're doing is taking a few weeks to talk about some of the big lies that we face from Satan and the world around us. So last week, we took a look at the lie, I don't really have to love my enemies. And if you didn't catch that sermon, it's on YouTube. I'd encourage you to go back and watch it. But this week, we're gonna talk about the lie it's not my job. Now, this lie has to do with serving, and I believe this is one of the most important lies to Satan because Satan, if he can convince you of this lie, knows that he is robbing you of the purpose and joy for your life. See, whether you realize it or not, serving is a part of what you're created for. It's a part of the design and plan that God has for your life, and it's in fulfillment of our plans and our designs for our life that we find joy and purpose and the, full, the fullness of life that we seek. But Satan wants you to buy into a lie that serving's not your job, that it's not a part of who you are. And if he can convince you of this lie, here's the problem. Your life ends up kind of like the Hubble telescope with this perfectly designed plan, but a small deviation leads to a little bit of a blurry mess as opposed to the beautiful picture. But what I will promise you is that if we can get back to our original design and our original purpose this morning, if we can learn to be a people who serve in the church, that we will find the purpose and the fulfillment and the joy that we seek in life. So if you guys have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can turn to Ephesians 2 this morning. It's where we're going to camp out. We're going to look at verses 8 through 10, and we're going to dive straight into this this morning. The verses 8 through 10 say, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So the first part of Satan's lie in convincing you that serving's not your job is to tell you that you don't have to do it, that it's just some optional part of life. Now, like any good, well-crafted lie, there is at least some truth to this. Right, Paul's gonna make it clear for us in verse nine that good works do not lead to our salvation. So a life of obedience and serving God is not what saves you, that that happens through justification, which means to be made right through the grace of God, which comes through faith in Jesus. So ser serving is not what leads to your salvation, but it is necessary to live out the purpose that God has intended for your life. So Paul says in verse nine, he says, hey, it's not requirement for salvation, but he does make a distinction with verse 10. He says, it may not be required for serving or for salvation, but good works are a part of who you are, that you were created to serve. 
And so what this means is that if you are a follower of Christ, that the purpose for your life and what you are made for is to serve. And if we fail to live that out, we're really missing the purpose for what we're created for. Now, if Paul is not convincing enough for you, listen to what God does in Genesis 1, 26 through 27. It said, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And after God creates man, Genesis 2 goes into a little bit more detail about what happens in Genesis 1. Genesis 2.15 says, the Lord God took the man, so this is right after he makes him, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So God creates man in his image, giving him authority over all the earth, but then he immediately places Adam into the garden to take care of the Garden of Eden. Now, this is an interesting concept because Genesis tells us a little bit about the Garden of Eden. It tells us it's a perfect land with perfect soil, with perfect rivers that flow through it, and trees that are good and fruit-bearing. And so what's interesting about this is God creates this perfect place that by all definition is self-sustaining. It needs no one to touch it. If you leave it alone, it will grow beautifully and perfectly. But God still places Adam in the garden to take care of it. Why? Because serving is a part of God, or Adam's purpose given by God. He is made in the image of God, and therefore, he serves. See, being made in the image of God does not just mean that we have authority, but it also means that we share in God's purpose. Everything God does, God does to advance his kingdom and bring his name glory. And so if we are made in the image of God, we, therefore, are also made to advance his kingdom and bring him glory. And serving is how we do that. Now, Adam is placed in the garden, and God gives him this job as an extension of his identity, that this is Adam's sole reason for existing, that he would take care of the garden. And he is fulfilling this purpose and worshiping and glorifying God as he lives this out by tending to God's creation. And the same thing is true for us as believers, that as we serve in the context of the church, that we are tending to God's kingdom and to his church, that we are the gardeners for the soil of the church, planting new seeds and taking care of the growth that exists. And serving is how we live this out. Now, Paul talks about what it looks like to serve and how this brings God glory in Romans 12, 1. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, that this is your true and proper worship. So Paul uses Romans 12 as a chapter to teach people what it looks like to live as a follower of Christ. And he starts off this chapter with a call. He says, "Live as, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, pleasing and holy to God. Now, the Greek word for bodies is the word somata. And somata has this concept of totality. To it. That as Paul calls us to offer ourselves as a sacrifice, he's not saying offer a piece of you. He's saying, look, everything you do has to be a sacrifice for God. And so, yes, we sacrifice in the concept of obedience, right? That we would learn to be holy and live in repentance, but we also sacrifice through our service in the same way that Jesus first sacrificed for us. And Paul says that as we live this out, that this is our true and proper worship, that serving glorifies God. And so as we fulfill our purpose of serving, we fulfill our purpose of glorifying God, that we exist for the glorification of God. But Satan likes to twist this lie and try to teach us to believe that we exist for gratification. He wants us to believe the lie that life's all about you, that life is really about what you can get out of it. And you can see this all throughout our culture. Just think about the stuff that it pushes on us, right? Our culture tells us that consumerism and materialism is the best, that if we can have all the stuff that we're happy. It tells us that self-care is the most important thing in the world, that just focus on you. Don't you worry about anyone else because you are what's important. It pushes that if you can just find the right things and be comfortable and successful, then you'll finally be happy. It pushes instant gratification and convenience so that we can have whatever we want, how we want it, and when we want it. 
And this bleeds beyond just normal life, even into things of the church, to the point that we start to think that church is about us. And so it's really about, well, do they have the worship I like? Is it the preaching I like? Do I feel good when I come there? And do I like what happens there? And if not, I'll just go find another church that makes me feel good about myself. And so all of these lies, what they're doing is they're conforming us into consumers. It's about us. And if you become a consumer, life becomes all about gratification. If I'm comfortable, if I'm happy, if I'm successful, I'm good. But what I will promise you is that this life of comfort and happiness and success that we so often chase, and it's a facade from the deceiver himself to rob you of the joy that God intended for your life. Because here's what I will promise you. You can achieve every dream you have ever dreamed. You can live the life that you always wanted to. You can have the family you always wanted to. You can have the job you've always wanted to. You can have the bank account you've always wanted to. You can have all the stuff in the world. You can live the dream life of your wildest imaginations more than anything you ever thought was possible and still feel like something's missing in your life. Because if serving is what you're created for, Nothing else will fill that void. How many of you know who Tom Brady is? Hopefully all of you. If not, I'm gonna help you out from under the rock you've been living under. Tom Brady, whether you like him or not, is probably the greatest NFL quarterback of all time. Fair to say, right? The dude holds, to this day, 23 NFL records between the regular and postseason. He won seven Super Bowls, he won five Super Bowl MVPs. He's made more money than he could ever know what to do with. He's dated and married supermodels. This dude has lived by all definitions of what the American dream is. He's got it. And yet he still feels like something is missing in his life. And that's not just me speculating. We know that because he said that. In the prime of his career, about halfway through his football career, he did an interview with 60 Minutes. And I want you to listen to what he said. He said, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me. I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life is great. Me, I think, it's gotta be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. Now, if you know Brady's story, you know that several years later, Brady retired, and then immediately came back out of retirement for two years. He now says that he is completely retired. But I've even seen articles recently that he has toyed with the idea of coming back. Why? Because he's chasing this feeling that he doesn't have, this void in his life that he doesn't know how to feel. And here's what this tells you, is that the dream life will never lead to a fulfilled life. That you can have everything you've ever wanted and it still fall flat. Because no man-made dream will ever replace your God-given purpose. Yeah. I'm gonna say that again to make sure you don't miss it. No man-made dream will ever replace your God-given purpose. You are created to serve in God's kingdom and bring him glory. We exist for glorification, not gratification. And so what I wanna challenge you this morning is not to put all your energy and efforts into chasing some dream life that you think's gonna make you happy but that you would pour all of your energy, your effort, and your resources into serving in the kingdom of God because it's in this that we live out our true and proper worship and a purpose for our lives. And here's what I will promise you. If you will conform to the purpose of your lives, if we can get back to that original design, the joy and fulfillment that you seek in all these other things, you will find in serving. And we know that because Jesus talks about this. In Matthew 25, Jesus was talking to his disciples about the parable of the talents. And I want you to look at what he says in verse 21. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, the Greek word for happiness in this passage is the word kara. And kara means a joy that comes from the awareness of God's grace and favor. So I'll say that again, joy that comes from the awareness of God's grace and favor. 
And so Jesus sets up this whole parable to talk to disciples about what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God and have responsibility in serving. And then he gets to this point where he says, look, if you can fulfill this purpose, what happens is that over time as you do this, you become aware that this is in fact the intended design for your life, that you understand that this is what you were created for, it is what you were saved for, and what you were called by Jesus to do. And in that, we finally understand our purpose. And if we understand our purpose, there is meaning to life, and there is a joy, kara, that comes from nothing else. You were created to serve, to glorify God and his kingdom through sacrificial service. So put your effort into that, because it's what brings you meaning, fulfillment, and joy. All right, look back on me at verse 10. We're gonna highlight some different things and talk about these. It says, for we are God's handiwork created for good works. Now, Satan doesn't just tell us the lie that it's not our job. This is a multifaceted lie that he's crafted really well. And so he starts by telling you it's not your job. And when that doesn't work, he then tells you you're not capable of doing the job, that you don't have the ability. But we're gonna talk some logic here for a second. If you understand that something is created, then you can understand that it is created to do something. And if it is created to do that, it is designed to fulfill that task. So here's the logic, are you ready? If you are created by God to serve, that means you are created to fulfill that task. And that means that you are uniquely gifted with abilities that help you accomplish your purpose. You are created to serve and you are uniquely gifted to serve. So don't buy into the lie that you don't have the abilities to serve because God created you for this. And I love that, that Paul uses the word handiwork to describe how we were created because it gives you this image of like painstaking detail and time and care. And you can see this in Genesis 2. If you go back and read Genesis 2, it details how we're created, that every other creation God makes in Genesis 1, he speaks into existence. We're the only creation he forms by hand. And so here's what that tells us, is that God took his time with us. God carefully crafted mankind. And that means that you are specifically designed with care to fulfill the purpose you were created for. And that means that you have talents and giftings that God has given you to fulfill your purpose. And what I think is really cool about the church is that there's not just like one area to serve. Like it's not like you have to have a specific set of abilities to do one specific thing and if you don't have that, too bad. Like there's so many different areas that you can get involved in that all work together. And so what's neat about it is there's so many different ways to serve. It covers every kind of ability and talent you could possibly have, right? If you've got musical talent, whether it's musical instrument or singing, right, you have the ability to serve on a worship team and help us produce great music. You can serve back in the back and mix sound, helping us to create the right sounds. If you're somebody who's gifted in connections, maybe you're the kind of person who people are drawn to you, you've got a smiling face, and you know that if somebody can just talk to you, they will feel welcomed and seen and loved. You can serve on our connections team and parking team or even come to suppers and showers and help us interact with our homeless friends. Some of you are gifted cooks and you have the ability to help us provide meals with things like suppers and showers or events or even hospitality moments where people are sick or maybe we provide meals for someone who's pregnant. Or, or maybe you're the kind of person who you're a teacher, it's natural, you're gifted in it and you can use your talents to help us train up the children and lead the next generation to follow Jesus. And I can give you example after example, I could do this all day. But the point is that you have unique and specific abilities that God has given you. And those abilities help you fulfill a purpose in the kingdom of God. Now, some of you may be sitting here thinking, Chris, that sounds great. I am not talented. I don't play a guitar. I don't even know how to work a computer, let alone run slides or a live stream. I am not good with children. I don't really know how to make coffee. Chris, I don't even like talking to people. I have no gifts and abilities. Here's what I'll say. Are there people who are naturally talented? Yes. There are people in this world who can walk on this stage, pick up a microphone, and sing like Celine Dion. There are people who are natural rock stars in children's ministry. There are people who are so gifted in connections that you're like, this is the, like I've never seen someone placed in a better spot to serve. But I will tell you that more often than not, People have to work to grow their abilities for serving. 
Many of you know that I play guitar. If you've been here any length of time, you know that I play typically like two to three year, uh, times a year. And it's one of those things I love to do. If we've got a big Sunday where we want to have big worship and I'm free enough, I love getting up there and playing on Sundays. But what you may not know about me is that when I started serving in worship guitar nine years ago, I was terrible. I did not know what I was doing. In fact, I really had only played kind of just in my bedroom every once in a while. And I had some friends in college who were college leaders for a youth ministry. And they were like, hey, do you want to uh, play guitar for the worship band? And I was like, uh, sure, sounds great. And so I go play. And the only experience I have at this point is that my dad has taught me a few rock songs on the guitar over the years. And that's really about it. And so I just had this like hard rock guitar. I had this metal distortion pedal. And I was like, all right, I can do this. And I came in knowing nothing. And I was terrible. And so what I had to do is I had to completely learn how to play worship guitar. And if I'm being honest with you, just learn how to play guitar in general. But over time with practice, and I just kept doing it over and over again, I practice and I practice and I practice and I got better and I got better. And now I have something that I do feel like is a gifting and an ability that I get to use. But I didn't start that way. And so I would say the same is true for most of you. Some of you have natural talents that you are incredible at. But many of us have to work to, to grow our giftings and our abilities to the place where we can use them. And that's okay. That's a part of this. And so here's my promise to you. If that's you and you feel that way, we want to help you grow in that. We are blessed not only with a talented staff, but with a talented group of people who serve here who will help train you in anything you want to learn. So whether it's worship, tech, children's, connections, you name it. We have people that can help grow your abilities and help get you to a place where you feel like you can make the biggest impact possible. And we would love to partner with you in that. But you also maybe sit here going, I don't really know what my abilities are. I don't really know where I would serve or what I would do. And we want to help you with that too. And so here's what you can do for me. If that's you and you're like, I, I would love to serve, but I don't even know what I can do. When you get done with church today, go to the Connect booth. There are serve cards. Grab that card, mark more information on it, and just let us know you want to talk to us. And we would love to help you figure out where you can serve with us or with our missions partners. Serving it's important and it's what we're gifted for. And so it matters. Now I will also encourage you and challenge you a little bit here. Don't get discouraged with small roles, right? Because some of us, the, our talents and our giftings may put us in serving positions that don't feel as glamorous, right? And so I wanna encourage you that you don't have to lead worship on a stage. You don't have to lead a, a small group or do any of these things to make an impact in the kingdom of God. Every way you can serve, every role we have is equally important to God and it's equally important to the mission of Kara City and the mission to the Big C Church. And so what I will promise you is that something that seems so small and insignificant, like holding a door open and smiling at someone when you say good morning, can be the difference in someone knowing Jesus. In fact, I love the way that Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 24. He says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are what? Indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. See, every role in serving is important in the kingdom of God. This isn't a one-man show. This isn't about who does something better than others or who gets the platform. Church is about a group of people who all come from different backgrounds with different abilities and talents coming together to serve the kingdom of God. And so as we fulfill that mission, every single role, no matter what it is, matters. And every single role makes an impact. No matter what you do for the kingdom of God, it is essential to the ministry of the church and it will change lives. So don't buy into the lie that you're not gifted enough to serve. You were created to serve, which means that you are uniquely gifted to serve. So nurture those abilities and learn to use them in the kingdom of God. All right, we're gonna look at Ephesians 2.10 one last time today, and we're gonna highlight some different things this time. So for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance. So I think the last way that God try, or Satan tries to convince us that, our, that serving is not our purpose really is just to convince us that it doesn't matter. And I think the biggest way that he does this is try to convince us that there's no real impact to serving, that it's perfectly fine if you just come to church and show up and sing some songs and go home because if you're a spectator, it's fine because the mission's gonna happen anyway. What difference would it really make if you were committed in serving? 
But here's what I'll tell you. That could not be further from the truth. Our service has a big impact. And here's why. If you were created to serve, you are uniquely gifted by God to serve. If you are uniquely gifted by God to serve, then the serving you do has to make an impact because God created you to do it. And so what I will promise you is that no matter what we do as the church, every bit of it matters. Every bit of it makes an impact. It's all important. And I love that Paul ends verse 10 with a reminder of what it is we're created to do. He says that we are created for good works that God prepared. And the reason I think this is interesting is the Greek words that Paul uses for good works are these two words that lend to the idea that as we serve and as we fulfill the mission of the church, that we're exposing the world around us to all of the good things of God, that people would see his mercy, they would see his love, his grace, and ultimately see his truth. And that if we live that out, and that's the purpose in our lives, then the impact that we have on that will change the world. But here's the thing. That kind of impact, it doesn't come by living out serving individually. It comes when we live and serve collectively as the church. Now, Greek is a pretty particular language. I didn't know if you knew that, but Paul uses the word we for a very specific reason. Every other time he addresses the church in this chapter, he addresses you, a plural you. But he switches when he talks about serving here to using we. Why? Because he wants us to understand who it is that's created for good works and why. That it's not just that you individually are created for good works but that you are created to serve in the context of a church community. And here's why that's so important. The impact we have as the church is so much greater than the impact that we'll have as individuals. Nathan and I were talking the other day about this and he was telling me about a conversation he'd had with someone a few months back. And I love one of the things that he said to that person when they were talking about this and trying to help them understand why this is important, Nathan said, that serving as an individual may change someone's circumstance, but serving as the church may change someone's eternity. Now that seems like an awfully bold statement, but that is not only the model, but the example that is set for us in the Bible, that we are created to serve in the context of the church. And when we do that, the impact we have is greater than anything else. In fact, we see this in Acts 2, 42 through 47. Look at the kind of impact that they had in that church. It said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were what? Together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The early Christians were deeply committed to being involved and serving in God's church. They were involved in community, but they were involved in serving. And it tells us that the impact they had was incredible. They started with the day of Pentecost with three, about 3,000 people coming to know Christ. And it said every single day, more and more people were getting saved. And we don't just have to look at the Bible to see an impact on that. We don't just have to say, well, I bet that was great 2,000 years ago. We're still feeling the impact of what the early church did 2,000 years later. That the fact that we are here worshiping together in this room tells you what kind of impact the early church had by living out the mission they're called to. And so here's what that'll tell us about us. That's the same kind of impact that we can have at Karis City. That we can have the kind of impact that impacts generation after generation, after generation, if we live out the purpose for which we are created for as followers of Christ. But that purpose does not come individually. It comes when we serve collectively as a whole, that we are committed to be together and to serve in the mission of the church. So, let me ask you this morning. Is serving your job? Do you understand that you were created to serve? Do you understand that you were uniquely gifted to serve and that living out the purpose on your life leads to the kind of impact that changes the world? 
And so I'm not saying this to guilt you into anything, but I want you to understand what you were created for. Are you living as a servant of God in his church or living as a spectator in his kingdom? And if that's you, my challenge to you this morning is simple. Get involved. It's not this big, complicated thing. I'm not gonna have you come down to the front and pray. The challenge is to do something about what we've talked about today. To be involved in the church, to be involved in the mission of God, to serve his church and his people. I've got two easy ways you guys can do that for me today. If you're not serving, there's one of two ways you can help me with this. The same Connect card I told you about at the Connect booth, as you leave today, there are serve cards there. They have all of our teams listed, all the different ways you can serve here. Let us know where you wanna serve. If you don't know where, let us know on there. If you don't wanna fill out a card in person, but you'd like to text, you can just text the word serve to the number on the screen and it does the same exact thing. But here's the deal. Don't go another day without living in the purpose you're created for. The very design and plan for our lives is that we would serve God and serve his kingdom. And if we can live that out, it'll change your life and we will change this world. You know, we've been a church at Care City for a, almost three and a half years now, uh, which is crazy in and of itself, but also just, it's still like a really short time to think about. And one of the things that I love to do, especially around this time of year, is to just kind of stop and think about what God's, God's done at Care City. And it really is kind of crazy to think about all the cool things that he's done. But I, I wanna tell you the single most mind-blowing impact we had to me comes from a single number. It's 46. 46 is the number of people that we've had the privilege to baptize as a church since starting in 2021. That's 46 eternities changed. That's families changed. That's generations impacted from now to eternity because we were faithful to the mission to serve as God's people. And here's what's even cooler. I think God's just getting started. That we have barely scratched the surface of what God will do through, here, through us at Karis City. And so I wanna encourage you and challenge you. Serve, be a part of this mission. Because if we will live this out together, if we will live out our purpose of serving together as God's church, we'll be blown away by what he does, by what he does. That we will have an impact bigger than anything we ever thought was possible. And God will use Kara City in bigger ways than he has up to this point. So don't buy into the lie that serving's not your job. When we buy into the lie that it doesn't matter or that we're not created for it or that we don't have the ability to do it, and we become just like the Hubble telescope. When we let the lies of Satan alter the design for our lives, we're left with this blurry result instead of the beautiful picture that was intended. But if we can get back to the original design God has, that we would be a people who serve passionately in his church, we will see this beautiful picture unfold of a world-changing impact and purpose that God created his church for. So, what will you do this morning? Will you buy into the lie that serving's not your job? Or will you live out the purpose you're created for and see the beauty that God intended for your life? Let's pray.